Rubel Al Assad, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. The last couple of days, we've seen a blizzard of promised concessions from Damascus. But do you think it's enough? Actually, uh, the speech that uh, President Assad made uh, two days ago, uh, it was very disappointing. And uh, today we are asking for actions and not words. And uh, he still has a very small uh, window of opportunity. Uh, as we've uh, heard, uh, Foreign Minister uh, William Hague and other leaders, they are all still giving him a, w a window of opportunity, and he should take that and move to actions right away. So he's offered an amnesty, he's offered a dialogue, he's offered multi-party elections, he's offered to pull the Ba'ath Party back from monopoly of power. None of that is enough. It's not that it's enough. The, the, uh, the main thing that he says, it's, uh, it's very interesting, and it's, of course we welcome it, but we need actions. They have and, said and this what before. what action? What do you need to see? He needs to move right away into forming a national unity government. They should allow uh, a multi-party system. They should allow all political parties who believe uh, in genuine democracy to be established in Syria. Uh, they have also to abolish the Article 8 of the Constitution, which is the most important, which states that the Ba'ath Party is the leader of state and society, which today is completely unacceptable. Um, you're saying also multi-party elections immediately, a national unity government. Yes. Why doesn't the president do this? Is he not actually in control? It seems like he's not. It seems like, as I said, a lot of people, it's a regime. Uh, it's not a one-person regime. It's a, uh, as we all know, uh, Bashar inherited the regime from his father. He did not, uh, he was not elected. And the people around him who inherited themselves the powers from their, their fathers uh, before them are the people who do not want to see any change. As I said, those people, they, don't, they are very worried about their own interests. At the same time today, we are also seeing people from the opposition who are... Uh, who are not, uh, I mean, they're not very democratic. A lot of them have lived in the West for the past years, for the past 30 or so, some of them uh, over 30 years. But again, they still continue to uh, incite hatred and sectarian violence, with, which again is completely unacceptable. And we, we don't want to see that in Syria. We don't want to get rid of a dictatorship to get a theocracy or another dictatorship in place. Just to look at the process, in what elements do you think this might be reminiscent of Egypt and Tunisia and in which elements not? Because in those cases we saw high level defections. There came a point where key figures within the establishment who might have previously taken the line that you're describing, thinking to themselves, it's now or never, I've got to jump. But it it's not exactly the case. Syria is very different from Egypt and Tunisia. Syria has a lot of minorities uh, and a lot of uh, uh, ethnic groups, for example. In Syria, uh, as you know, we have the Kurds, uh, you have Arabs, you have Sherkas, you have Turkmen, you have Armenians, you have Christians, uh, you have Muslims, Alawites, Sunnis, Shias, uh, Druze. Uh, and of the, course, uh, those figures at the top of the establishment that you were mentioning a minute ago, yes. the, the, the ones at the, at the heart of particularly the security forces, they are predominantly Alawite. Again, this is not true. This is what the, the opposition is trying to, uh, uh, to tell uh, the, the international community. But this is not true. You know, we have to be fair here. You know, there is a president is an Alawite. His cousin is an Alawite. His brother is. But a lot of generals, including, for example, uh, the ex-minister of defense and his son, uh, you know, uh, Manaf Tlas, who is also, uh, uh, you know, member of the presidential guards. You have uh, the vice president, who is not. You have Ali Mamluk, head of a secret uh, apparatus, who is not. So uh, the prime ministers and a lot of other ministers are not. So, so coming back to the question I was asking you, why yes. aren't we seeing high-level defections? I mean, you started describing because a situation people... of an ethnic ta and religious tapestry. Yes. But how does that relate to people's unwillingness to defect because at the top ag level? Again, a lot of people want changes, but they don't want to see uh, people similar to the ones that were at the Antalya conference coming, you know, and they're the ones that You mean that the Antalya conference as in the, the conference at the beginning of this month by yes. opposition groups in Turkey? Yes, exactly. Why don't they but want to see because that? Because they are, there are a lot of Islamists who were there. That consultative council that came out of that meeting yes. in Turkey, uh, that they said that their objectives were to support the demonstrations and to help raise international pressure against uh, President Assad. And that, to quote uh, their documentation, the, re the revolt in Syria is a national movement that does not aim to undermine any sect. It's true, but they're trying to hijack those peaceful demonstrations. As we have all heard the people when they first came out, uh, the protesters, they were all chanting, peace, 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 uh, uh, one, 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 all the Syrian people are one. So the opposition has to listen to what the people are saying, the same way as we are asking uh, in the, the regime to listen 
at those protesters and their, uh, what they're chanting. We are also asking the opposition to be uh, not to do the same mistake as the regime and to start listening to the to the slogans of those protesters. They don't want to see any separations. Any kind of opposition should have all groups who believe in democracy, in genuine democracy, not people but coming, who are... But, but coming back to this group in power, presumably yeah. the problem there is that they're, they're having the kind of paranoid response that you're describing, and that means instead of seeing uh, the opposition as a national opposition, they're seeing it as representing uh, sectional interests. I mean, we've heard, of course, yes. the president talking about saboteurs and conspirators. Yes, yes. In one way, uh, as I said, there are people in, the, in, the, in his own regime, in the security apparatus, who have done a lot of, uh, who have committed a lot of atrocities and repression against the people, which is, uh, you know, this is, uh, I mean, uh, acts of atrocities, it's completely unacceptable. On the other side, you have also people, Islamists, who are trying to hijack those protesters and are committing also acts of violence. And I've seen some videos, for, uh, you know, in which uh, there were horrible languages used when they killed those soldiers at Dusha Shore, for example. Uh, one of the people saying, uh, look at this uh, dog, he looks like an Alawite because of his haircut. Well, well, that's a measure of how dangerous, I suppose, things, things are becoming. So, is, so getting back to the, basic, yes. the basics of the struggle, yes. do you think there is anything that the president could say or do at this point, other than more brutal retaliation, which would persuade protesters to go home? I think that the first thing that you should do, they should form a national reform implementation committee. And this committee, uh, you know, it, it should include people from the democratic opposition and people from the regime. They should sit together and discuss how they're going to form a national uh, unity government. And they should put uh, a schedule, you know, they should put a clear timetable. To and that. you think that's still possible? Because, of course, there are some who think events have gone beyond that. And for the opposition who've seen some of their members tortured, uh, killed, uh, they may feel that there is no future that to, that to risk their lives by going into some kind of talks with the government would only uh, provoke further outrages. Um, t today, the, you know, the, the thing is that the regime is there. You know, Bashar, uh, Bashar is there. Uh, so it's, uh, we have to be very practical and pragmatic. It's either he's going to bring change or he has to step aside. And he has to do it right away. There's not, he cannot waste any, any, uh, you know, any more time. The French Foreign Minister, Alain Juppé, says it's yes. too late already. He says some believe there's still time for him to change his ways and commit to a reform process. For my part, I doubt it. He says, I think the point of no return has been reached. No, it hasn't been reached, and as you've seen, uh, well, other leaders, uh, you know, international, uh, from the international community have not completely agreed to that, because they know that the situation is not as easy, and he still has, uh, you know, uh, support of his, you know, of his party. He has some support, you know, uh, and also he has support of Iran and of other groups in, in the region, uh, and any sectarian conflict in Syria, we have to avoid it, because that would have a very negative effect on the whole region. And so talking about what, what he should or would do, do you think there's a danger that he will go on, or those around him will go on, trying to bludgeon the public into submission, uh, trying to crush the uprising by force? The people around him, I said, is in, in their interests. Of course it's an interest, because as a, any reforms would mean that they will be trialed. You know, a lot of them will be held into account, and they will have to pay the price for what they've done. And obviously this brings up all kinds of painful ghosts from the past and indeed the President in his speech on Monday referred to the problems of the, of the 1980s, yes. which in 1982 Syria saw the last uh, terrible slaughter following an uprising um, and fears that we're seeing now a new generation suffering the same kind of tragedy. Yes. And this, of course, particularly resonant for you because many people Many critics, including the Syrian Human Rights Committee, including Amnesty International, accuse your father of masterminding the repression on that occasion. Yes. First, we also have to remember that at the time, the regime wanted to blame everything on my father. My father was not involved in Tuhama. My father was head of a unit called Unit 569, because at the time there wasn't any Republican guard or any uh, presidential guards. The, the Unit 569's job was the protection of Damascus, the capital. And uh, as you know, Hama is 200 kilometers outside of Damascus. So we had internal uh, troubles in, in Syria, internal danger from the Muslim Brotherhood, who were uh, an armed group who, raised, you know, who rose against the state. And again, there was uh, the danger of, uh, it, there was at the same time the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. 
So it, uh, and as you know, Lebanon is much closer. I mean, the borders of, of Lebanon is much closer than Hama, than from the capital. So it's not logical that my father would, uh, you know, take his troops from outside, you know, from Damascus and go 200 kilometers outside of the capital uh, to fight the, the Islamists. While you had many regiments I'm just going to have government. to quote you others. I mean, I quoted already no, no, the Syrian Human Rights Committee, mm -hmm. Amnesty International, also the American author, Thomas Friedman. He quotes Western diplomats saying President Assad entrusted overall responsibility for taming Hama to your father. Yes, as I said, because my father was the only person at that time who was calling for democracy in the 70s, he was the only person who had uh, a media out there, I mean, uh, the Al-Fursan magazine, who was every edition calling for democracy and why democracy was important for a country like Syria, he was, the, the regime at the time was getting very annoyed with him. He had the support of the Ba'ath Party, he had a lot of support in the military, so they wanted him out. And in 84, after, as you know, the, the you know, the, 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 the conspiracy that happened to take him out of Syria. The regime wanted to go into negotiation with the Muslim Brotherhood, which they did. But it's simply not credible, is it, to, to say that this is all a, a conspiracy cooked up by the other side of the Assad family to, to paint your father as the villain. I mean, he's on record, for example, in 1980, mm. uh, quoted in the official newspaper, Tishrin Daily, saying the, of the Muslim Brotherhood, we will wage 100 wars in order to exterminate them. But this is inaccurate and I've never heard it. Again, I told you that the people, for example, Friedman, as you, you've mentioned him before, he says in his book that a friend of him told him that my father told him, so we cannot base things, realities, on somebody told somebody, and he doesn't even name the sources, he doesn't come out with any uh, justifications. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Robert Fisk, who, uh, whom I sat it's with... Not Robert, it's not just Robert Fisk. I'm mean, saying those, those people, days, I said, we... Mr. Friedman, Mr. Fisk, you know, Mr. Fisk has been there for 18 minutes. He told me, you know, I read it in his book. So you cannot just come out and blame everything on somebody just of what was said uh, or, uh, you know, uh, the, the regime quote, told you, quote that. you, for example, I mean, it's not just a question of, of these There's journalists. No, of but Amir al-Azm, for example, at the Syrian opposition consultative council, which we yes. were talking about in, in Turkey, meeting there, mm -hmm. he says, from the Syrian people's point of view, the crimes of Rifat, your father, are well documented. Ribal, yourself, has not stepped out from his father or condemned the crimes. Ribal and Rifat will not be welcome at the opposition council. But what does uh, Mr. Al-Adam represent? Who does he represent? And this is what also what we have to see. Who does he represent? Where are the, the crimes that he's talking about, the documented? Where is the responsibility that he's talking about? You know, we sh this is why we should not talk, we should not blame each other if you don't have justification. When I talked about but some people the, at, on the council... Yes, but the Syrian Human groups. Rights Council, yes, Amnesty right. International, mm -hmm. many journalists, um, diplomats, uh, historians. We have talked to a number of people in the last couple of days yes. trying to get to the bottom of yes. the Hama massacre yes. and the evidence surrounding your father's involvement. And I have to tell you, I have not met anyone or talked to anyone over the last couple of days other than yourself yes. who believes that your father didn't mastermind this. So quite apart from the historical question of whether or not he did, yes. you have a problem of perception. There, there is a problem. Of course there is a problem because I said the regime, you know, you're against a regime and at the time the regime, you know, it was very strong and everybody sided with him. Like for example in 99 when they bombed our house in Latakia and they came out and said it was an illegal port. I was in 99 and I had just left Latakia to see my, my, my family in Spain and all the Western media came out and gave the, this, uh, you know, the... Uh, what you know the the side of the regime they, they give their story they said the minister of uh, uh, of information in syria came out and said it was we attacked an illegal board belonging to rifat al-assad thanks to youtube today you could see that it was a house and just, there are just getting back to the hammer massacre bombed. though yes. has your father ever condemned the massacre he said in, in his uh, only i think interview with the ap a few years ago he said i've never been to hama and i have nothing to do with hama that's not actually condemning what happened there he, he never, everybody is against what happened. I mean, everybody is against any killing between, you know, uh, your own people. We are all against any, any atrocity, any repression. We are, you know, this is why we've been working for democracy all these years. Because it's very important, as I said, in a country like Syria, that we move towards democracy. This is the only way, religious pluralism is the only way that a country like Syria could survive and that everybody could live together, all minorities could live together, protect her under the rule of law. So, on that score, I mean, you are uh, in charge of an organization based here called the Organization of Democracy and Freedom, yes. so political pluralism, and yes. on the religious side, the Imam Foundation. Yes. But what do you have to contribute? You lived in exile for most of your life. Yes. You have all the problems of your surname. You have the problems surrounding your father's history. Yes. I have, I'm like any other citizen, being an, an Assad is not, 
any person, any citizens of Syria, has the right to work for democracy and freedom in his country. This is something that should not be, uh, it's not, you cannot be barred, you know, just from being an Assad for working for democracy. I'm not here uh, bidding for, uh, you know, um, for, for a bit, I'm not With having respect, any bid for power. you're not really just any other exile, are you? I mean, there you are living in Mayfair on one of the I'm most wealthy streets in, 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 not, this in is, London. This is, uh, actually, I had an interview with CNN today, the, you know, three days ago, and they came to my place, and I'm not living in Mayfair. This, again, we have to be, uh, you know, very clear and, and know exactly the facts before we talk about things. I don't live in Mayfair. I live actually in the Marylebone area. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a businessman. I started uh, doing businesses in China. I've, I went to China in 2003 and set up a trading office there. And I'm working like any other, uh, you know, uh, young person. I could have been uh, in Syria uh, with, with the regime, working with the regime and taking advantage of the system or so, being a corrupt so, person, so but I would never to, accept that. So coming back to what you can contribute then, yes. you're not in Syria. You've barely spent any time in your life in, yes. in Syria. You can't, for reasons of this family history, participate in all the exile movements, the, the meeting in Turkey, etc. As we've said, you're not welcome there. What can you contribute to Syria's future? But any person is, they are not, you know, we have, uh, there's not the opposition groups are not just the people who were at the Antalya conference. There are many uh, opposition groups. We are, uh, for example, setting up a conference which we, will be held up uh, very soon. And you will see that there are many other people. We are a very large group and, uh, you know, that have nothing to do with the Antalya, the people who are at the Antalya conference, which, which were m uh, mostly Islamists. For example, the Kurds were not there. You know, all the Kurdish groups were not there. Uh, uh, the Damascus Declaration people, they were not there. So a lot of people, a lot of opposition people were excluded. And if you want to work for a future of a country together, if you want to build the future of a country together, we have to believe in reconciliation. We have to, uh, to be forgiving. We, have, uh, we cannot work, but, but, you know, but, work but, with hatred and uh, holding grudges and say, uh, this person is an Assad, this person is an Alawite. But it's not so easy to shrug off history, is it? I mean, for decades of dynastic rule in Syria by the Assad family. And just to quote you, uh, Walid Safur, for example, of the Syrian Human Rights Committee, he says, the Assads that ruling Syria is a matter for the Assad family. They are hated by the majority. Well, he's, Mr. Walid Safur was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, so he could say whatever he wants, you know. Uh, so you just shrug that off. There isn't a, pro there isn't a problem but, with your it's family not Assad. There isn't, the, not all the Assads. This again, you have a lot of Assads in Syria. They, should, they can go and check themselves before talking about the whole Assad family, which 95% of the family, of the Assad family, uh, have no privileges. A lot of them don't own cars. A lot of them can, don't have jobs. So they should not talk about the whole Assad family. They should not talk about the whole otherwise. They should not talk about uh, a sect or everybody. Or, you know, they should always choose the people. We have to be uh, very transparent. So I'm still puzzled by what future you see for yourself in, in, in this new Syria. Do you expect that you will be able to go back and play a political role? I don't want any political role. All what I'm doing is, as I said, is campaigning for democracy and freedom for my country. All what I want is I have a baby son now. I want him to grow up, you know, being able to go back to his own country, visiting him without being, uh, uh, living in fear of being killed because he's an, uh, you know, he's an Alawite or, or so you uh, won't go back or an Assad or, you hope for, or without you hope, being by the regime, stopped by the regime, arrested by the regime because he's my son. Or, so you hope for a better future for the next generation, but your generation? No, I even hope for my generation that, that I could be one day back. be able, yes, I, I couldn't since 99, since they bombed our house, I wasn't able to go back, you know, and I, I, who doesn't love to be able to go back and see his family in, in his country? I have many nephews and these that I haven't met yet because they, they live in Syria. But your, just, to, just to be absolutely clear, your role in the political future of Syria, not a frontline political role? No, no, not at all. You know, I, I refuse that. As I said, I love too much my freedom. I, want, I enjoy you know, living the, you know, in, in the West. I enjoy the freedom that we all enjoy, but I want every Syrian to enjoy that. You know, I, want to, to, you know, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't love, uh, you know, I wouldn't like to live locked you know, uh, in a such a, you know, in a system anywhere, in anywhere in the world. Hard to see, though, that, that the struggles that you're talking about are anything other than ones inside the Assad family, rather than the struggle of those on the streets of Damascus, Aleppo, Daraa. In what way? What, what do you mean by it's hard to see? 
Well, as you're describing assassination attempts, the issues of corruption, the yes. questions of history, yes. um, your family, not any other family, and not any other family today, not any other family tomorrow, whatever you would wish for your son. Yes. Uh, as I said, we don't want anything from, you know, as from my own point of view, I don't want anything to have to do with the government. Or what I want is a better life for everybody, for every Syrian citizen. I want them to live free from repression, uh, free, free from a dictatorship regime. It's all what, what matters. And what is the time scale for that then? Because just to quote you, for example, Israel's Defense Minister Ehud Barak, he said this week, President Assad will reach his demise within six months. What do you see? What's the time scale? I honestly think it's, we are at a brink, uh, at a brink of, uh, you know, a regional war. And it's, it's very dangerous because uh, the regime in Syria is not a regime standing on its own. It's a regime that has alliances with uh, Iran, with a lot of groups like Hezbollah, with groups like uh, Sadr militias in Iraq, and other, many other groups in Iraq. So regional war is a distinct possibility? It's a very big possibility. Libel al-Assad, thank you for joining us. On You're welcome.